would uh, want to, uh, first of all, again, thank Dr. Sanford for his very substantial contributions uh, that he made uh, yesterday. I, I really think, looking over the outline that he gave us, that I can uh, make my own all of this. Uh, it's certainly true that from the von Hildebrand side, the work of Aristotle with and, and of Thomas needs to be read with greater care and oversimplifications need to be avoided. And that will certainly have the effect of bringing the two uh, schools of thought closer uh, together. Uh, and at the same time, the, he, he's certainly right that the metaphysical dimension of value, the kind of property that it is, uh, that that's all in a fairly rudimentary form in von Hildebrand and needs further development. And perhaps just the encounter with the Aristotelian Thomistic tradition uh, could uh, provide a lot of good impetus for that still un undeveloped side of uh, von Hildebrand. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's also very well observed uh, by him that one reason that von Hildebrand has been marginalized is um, from the domestic side is that uh, one uh, often thought no really significant new ideas could arise outside of that tradition. And I uh, would just add one, uh, one factor there that uh, has played a large role, and that is uh, the idea uh, that uh, was very strong at the uh, beginning of the 20th century, that any serious Catholic thinker has to be a Thomist. And so he, having his formation in the school of Husserl and not thinking of himself as Thomist, was by that very reason uh, held in suspicion. And uh, so I think that uh, John Paul, ha having said in Fides et Ratio that the church has no official philosophy and there is a place for non-Thomistic voices in the Catholic tradition, uh, the way is open for uh, von Hildebrand getting a hearing that uh, was often hard for him to get when Thomism was so identified with the Catholic philosophy. So uh, I uh, uh, appreciate the challenge that you give us and, and the agenda that you propose to us for conducting this dialogue into uh, the future. We were discussing yesterday the distinction between the ontological and qualitative values in von Hildebrand. And later on in this uh, work from which you have the excerpt, uh, he added as a third thing, somehow between the ontological and qualitative values, these values of perfection. Now let me just um, explain what uh, he means by them. We were into this right at the end of our last session yesterday morning, but didn't quite finish it. Uh, so these values of perfection uh, uh, are, are found in certain powers of man, such as <coughs> intelligence, free will, memory, the sense powers. Uh, we just have to think of what these powers typically do, that is, what function each has. Uh, and then we think of that function being well performed. And we have uh, a value of perfection in the sense of von Hildebrand. So uh, uh, the, the mind, the intellect, is made to discern reality. Uh, so we speak of a good mind where the powers of discerning are disciplined and focused, where the mind really proceeds intelligently. Um, that would be such a value of perfection, where the function proper to a power is well performed. Or uh, if a memory 
uh, is strong, not only short-term, but long-term. Uh, if it's reliable, we speak of a good, not a weak, but a good, strong memory. Or we speak of good sight, uh, as opposed to frail and weak sight. And so with the will, um, we can speak of a uh, value of perfection with a will that is not wavering and irresolute, uh, but uh, is strong and can carry through with a uh, commitment. So uh, we might speak in that sense of a good will, where good should have the ring that good has when we speak of someone having a good mind or a good memory. Now, it seems to me that these values of perfection um, come fairly close to McIntyre's functional values, the values that arise when the work of a thing is well performed. Now, the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the debate kicks in, and the issue on my mind yesterday comes to light when we uh, bring in the idea of von Hildebrand that qualitative values, and especially moral values, are not such values of perfection. So the will at work in a moral virtue is not just uh, an imminently perfected will. It's not just a will that has this value of perfection. It's not just a will where the power of willing is fully developed. Uh, so the idea in von Hildebrand that uh, seems to me to have great merit is that a morally good will is not the same as a functionally good will, and that therefore moral value is not the same as this value of uh, perfection. Perhaps one can see that by uh, considering that wicked persons can have functionally very good wills. Uh, I forget which villain of Shakespeare it is, maybe Iago, uh, who has the famous soliloquy about one's passions being like a garden, and you have to see to it that the garden doesn't get overrun. It has to be carefully cultivated. That's the idea of a cultivated will, which has this value of uh, perfection. But it is, in the case of Yago, a will that is altogether perverse <coughs> and wicked. So uh, the, the, the distinction I'm driving at can al almost be heard uh, if you think of a good will in the moral sense, like when Kant says, nothing is good without qualification except a morally good will. Uh, and, and, and by contrast, think of good in the sense in which we speak of a good memory, a good mind, or a good will in the sense of a functionally strong will. Uh, good has a different ring according as it expresses this imminent perfecting of the will or expresses this moral excellence of the will. Uh, and so I, I would uh, try to capture the thought of von Hildebrand saying that the morally good will uh, has a transcendent perfection. Uh, and not just an imminent one. It's made, it becomes morally good by telling the truth, by helping the stranger, by making sacrifices for one's friend, to refer to the striking passage in Aristotle that uh, Dr. Sanford read to us uh, yesterday. Uh, one could say, connecting it with von Hildebrand, that the will becomes good by living in this spirit of value response. Uh, but that's a different principle of goodness than the principle of 
imminent perfecting of the volitional power that makes for the value of perfection. And so to the extent that McIntyre tends to fold the moral value into that value of perfection, I think something important for ethics gets lost. Now, um, we were distinguishing ontological and qualitative values. And in the case of the human person, um, the qualitative values are not limited to the moral values, but those are the, let's say, the most significant ones. And we'll let them stand for uh, the qualitative values that man is capable of. Now, in the course of drawing this distinction between the ontological value that goes with the kind of being a thing is, and the qualitative values in and through which a person flourishes, von Hildebrand uh, introduces the Platonic notion of participation. And uh, though I uh, quoted it in that class yesterday morning, I want to quote these sentences just once more because it seems to me um, uh, a point of great significance and, and particular depth and, and not perhaps entirely easy to get a hold of. So uh, there at the top of 138, the ontological value is so closely connected with the respective being, in our example the human person, that it is impossible to describe the relation between the person and his ontological value as a participation in the value. With moral goodness, however, we have a natural tendency to admit that, say, the act of forgiving participates in the moral value of generosity and mercy. The ontological value is immanent to the being, let's say fully embedded in it, in a way of one piece with it, but moral values transcend the being which is endowed with them so that those beings having some kind of moral goodness uh, seem to participate in something higher. Now, that um, idea of, uh, so, so the idea is that the value of a thing can be related to uh, the so-called bearer of the value in very different ways. Sometimes the value is uh, completely impacted in the being, as in the case of the ontological value of uh, a being. But at other times, the um, Value is, as it were, something from above in which the morally worthy person seems to participate. Uh, and we were saying in the last class that perhaps one sign of that participation is that uh, in moral striving we have the sense of always only just beginning. Uh, we're never finished, and indeed, we're never finished with just beginning. It's as if we always can become vastly more than we are. Whereas the ontological value is a fixed quantity. You have it or don't. It can't be lost. It's not able to be augmented. Uh, and, and so that goes with it being embedded in the being that has it. Whereas um, this uh, growing into ever greater moral worthiness is somehow evidence of this, uh, as von Hildebrand says, participation uh, in something higher. Uh, now, I wanted to um, use this opportunity to show you another case of participation in something higher, uh, a case that's even stronger than that of uh, moral value, just to uh, uh, somehow give us a feel for this talk of a value that's just not entirely possessed by the being that has it, but that 
is, as it were, participated in. Um, and this gives us an occasion to take a, a, a look at von Hildebrand's aesthetics. In his aesthetics, and he regarded this as the central contribution that he made in aesthetics, he uh, develops the concept of what he calls the beauty of second power. And that's a kind of beauty, a kind of aesthetic excellence, which completely surpasses the bearer of the beauty. So for instance, uh, take one of the heavenly Mozart melodies, a few simple notes. The simplicity of it is uh, striking, a simple tempo. And you, you hear it, and an unearthly beauty breaks in upon you. And so von Hildebrand says, uh, look at that discrepancy between the bearer of the beauty, simple sounds in a simple order, and the unearthly beauty that they, as it were, mediate to us. Uh, and so uh, normally the, the beauty of a thing is somehow proportioned to the thing which is beautiful, yeah, the beauty of a moral character proportion to uh, the moral character. But here, it's as if there's um, a, 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 a breathtaking beauty all out of proportion to the ontological modesty of the bearer. Uh, and he goes so far as to say that in these cases, the beauty seems to rest on the beautiful thing as a, a beautiful object rests on a pedestal. It seems that the beauty somehow descends from above uh, and is made by the genius of the artist to rest for a moment on this very, ontologically speaking, modest pedestal. And that is, for von Hildebrand, a great natural mystery, this power of um, uh, the visible and audible to, uh, as it were, open the heavens for us and uh, conjure uh, up this uh, often uh, breathtaking beauty that makes us shudder when we uh, experience it. And uh, he um, uh, cites here, and I, I think I'll uh, follow him in citing it, a um, passage uh, from Newman where exactly this uh, uh, mystery of music is raised. And, and, and bear in mind, what interests me here is the theme of participation. The, the, the beautiful Mozart melody doesn't completely possess in itself the beauty. But uh, here, the um, idea of participation very strongly suggests itself. Something vastly higher is mysteriously evoked and made present. So um, uh, Newman captures this um, uh, participation and this well-known passage, there are seven notes in the scale, make them fourteen. Yet what a slender outfit for so vast an enterprise. What science brings so much out of so little? Out of what poor elements does some great master in it create his new world. Shall we say that all this exuberant inventiveness is a mere ingenuity or trick of art without reality, without meaning? Is it possible that that inexhaustible evolution and disposition of notes, so rich yet so simple, so intricate yet so regulated, so various yet so majestic, should be a mere sound which is gone and perishes? Can it be that those mysterious stirrings of heart and strange yearnings after we know not what and awful impressions from we know not whence <coughs> should be wrought in us by what is unsubstantial and comes and goes and begins and ends in itself? No, it is not so, it cannot be. They, uh, these 
notes and their beauty, have escaped from some higher realm. They are the outpourings of eternal harmony in the medium of created sound. Something are they besides themselves, which we cannot compass, which we cannot utter. So that um, evocation, you might say, of some uh, world-transcending mystery uh, by some very poor, visible, or audible um, work of art, uh, that, uh, that, I think, is uh, value, uh, that, that is a being participating in value, not owning the value in, in, in the clearest of ways. Now, Von Hildebrand does not say that with moral value that the value just rests on the morally good person as on a pedestal. It really is embodied in the morally good person, and he or she is thereby made to be good. But he still wants to say that in moral value, too, something of this participation in something higher, uh, in contrast to what we find with the uh, ontological values, uh, where the talk of participation doesn't suggest itself at all. Uh, that uh, is his proposal. Uh, and uh, I, uh, and, and very interesting, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll end it with that, is his uh, suggestion that um, he um, uh, uh, tries to bring together a, a, a truth in Plato and a truth in Aristotle. He says that the Platonic participation idea finds a certain natural fulfillment with the qualitative values, and especially with those aesthetic values of second power. Uh, but the Aristotelian idea that the value is not transcendent and participated in, but proper to the being and in it, that finds its truth most of all, he claims, with the ontological values. So there's uh, an attempt here with his ontological qualitative distinction somehow to uh, uh, capture something Aristotelian, something Platonic, and find the place for them. Uh, so uh, I, I, I'm not claiming that this is in any conflict with uh, any uh, thing in Aristotle or St. Thomas, because as you say, there's plenty of Platonism through Augustine in Thomas. Uh, but it, uh, it, uh, I, I've always been fascinated by the way in which this Platonic notion of participation uh, is uh, somehow captured at the level of our lived phenomenological experience. Yes, no, I, I um, am, am <coughs> aware of that uh, participation idea in Aristotle, and I heard it often from uh, Morris Clark um, when he was here. What I think um, uh, catches my attention in uh, these pages of von Hildebrand is the way in which the participation is brought so close to experience. It's not speculatively reached, as when we, you know, reason about God as the origin of all things, an esse ipse subsistent in which everything must participate. Uh, it's not so much a speculative conclusion as rather um, a participation that's almost felt uh, when one follows his train of thought. That um, phenomenological contribution to the participation idea seems to me um, a, a particular merit of it.